Hello and welcome to Gibraltar Masters, our first masterclass with the one and only Hikaru Nakamura. Hikaru, welcome. Good to be back in Jib. Yeah, it's good to be back. Uh, I've been here for many years now in a row, so it's pretty good. Uh, just uh, hopefully I can play well. This is the first time I've started off, I think, with two draws, so it hasn't been ideal, but uh, it's a long tournament. Long tournament to go indeed, and uh, now you won this event four times, <laughs> and you keep coming back here. What do you like about Gibraltar so much? Um, there are many things. I think the the restaurants are good. There's La Mala, La Mamala close by. There are also some restaurants down the marina that I've been to. Um, the people are quite friendly. It's a very nice mix between uh, Gibral. I think it's Gibraltarans. I, I talked about this on my stream last night as well. Um, but Gibraltarans, it's sort of this mix between uh, British and Brits and Spaniards. So it's it's a quite uh, an eclectic mix. And um, and just uh, the weather as well is also quite nice. It tends not to be raining windy or snowy like in <laughs> certain other parts of the world. Right. Now, in, uh, in your eyes, how have you seen the festival grow and evolve over the years that you've been here? Yeah, it's changed a lot. I think when I uh, when I first played here, I think it was 2005, if I remember correctly. It was around that time. Um, the years sort of all blend together after a while. But um, when I came here the first time, I remember there was the restaurant downstairs, Nuno's, and it was actually open back then. You could you could play your game, go down and eat dinner there. And um, I think from probably like 2008 or 2009, um, there always are people playing downstairs, so the restaurant is never open. Um, and I think it's a sign to how, how big the, the event has become. There's so many people playing now that all the space here is being used by everyone to play, to analyze, and it's a fantastic atmosphere. Okay, so we're going to look at a game that I played against uh, Pavel Elyanov in the Isle of Man tournament this past October. And there are a couple of reasons that I'm going to show this game. First of all, this was the game in the last round of the event, so I'd lost the previous round to Arkady Nidic, which uh, basically cost me any shot at winning the event. Um, but there are other things too. So like, one thing I think everyone assumes is we're, we're professional players, so normally we don't make amateur mistakes. We tend to be very focused. It's all about the game. And in this game, there actually was a certain outside event that, that affected me. Um, and it, luckily it didn't cost me the game, but it turned it from being what should have been a simple, smooth, uh, short victory into a very long seven hour game where I was fortunate to win at the end. So there, there are a bit of there's a bit of everything in this game. Um, that's quite I'll interesting. Get to, I'll get to that at a because certain Because that's point, quite yeah. a challenge for a lot of us, in fact, where we've got other factors affecting us while we're playing. I think the professionals mm -hmm. just do it better. The idea of sort of really focusing and blocking things out, but sometimes right. even that doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll explain it anyway. Well, I might as well just say it now. But basically what happened is, is my stepfather, who I think probably a fair amount of you have heard of, um, Snowware Montre, he's going to be coming in on Friday, so everyone can, can, can go ask him about this uh, in a couple of days. But uh, basically, he had to leave early from the event. So I started the last round game. He took a bye, and he had to fly back to New York. Um, but the thing was, his flight, I think, was at maybe 5 p.m., and the round started at 1.30, something like this. So he had to leave around, like, 3.30 or 4 o'clock. Um, now, normally, it wouldn't matter. I was just going to play a normal game. But it turned out that I got a very good position. Um, as we'll get to that in a second. But I got a very good position. And at a critical moment, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to win this game, play a simple move, and you know that way I can see him off. It's all good. The tournament's over. Just nice, nice, easy, like three-hour win. And of course, the one move I played. Then, uh, as soon as I played the move, I realized that it didn't work because when Pavel made his move, I thought for 40 minutes. Oh. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, that's just a little sidebar as far another reason I'm showing this game. So, without further ado, I think we should probably get into the game. So it started d4, knight f6, c4, e6. Uh, knight of three b6. Um, this can turn into many different things. It can become standard Queen's Indian. Um, normally black plays like bishop e7 here, for example, and it's just uh, castles, castles. And like you can play knight c3, rook e1, many different moves here. But uh, Pavel played bishop b4, which is a completely reasonable move as well. Not, not as common, certainly. Bishop b2, bishop b7, castles. And now he played the move c6. So, uh, Hikaru, could you explain to us this idea that black employs many times of playing bishop b4, provoking mm -hmm. bishop to d2, and then just going back. It might seem like a waste of a tempo, but it's really not. Yeah, I mean, the main, the main reason black does is because normally, for example, if you pl it, this wouldn't happen in normal theory, but for example, let's just say you play something like c6 here. Uh, white can play b3, d5, bishop b2, let's just say knight d7, and white can put the knight on c3 or d2 here, and the bishop is much better placed on b2 than it is on c3. So for example, um, if you look at the game, in the game I played knight c3, uh, but for example, if I were to play a move like bishop c3, black can play d5, let's say b3, and black can even start with something like knight e4 here, gaining a tempo uh, and hitting the bishop on c3, and after bishop b2, 
Uh, maybe something like f5 or just even standard development with castles, but the bishop's a little bit awkward on c3, whereas you'd like to just put it on b2 in one go. So the idea of bishop b4, bishop e7 is to stop white from getting an ideal setup with bishop b2 and knight c3 very mm -hmm. easily. Yeah, pretty much, uh, because like here, like in the game I play knight c3, and this is theory because you kind of don't have a choice, but I really would like the bishop on b2. I'd like right. it on the long diagonal. Um, I would, I would much prefer that as opposed to having the bishop on d2, where like it can still go to g5 or f4, but it's not, um, it's not as good. I okay. mean, obviously you still have to play the position because this is this is known, but um, that's the reason Black does this is you don't want the bishop on the long diagonal. So all right, so, so the game went c6, knight c3, and now d5. It's worth noting c6 also is, uh, is is a critical move because if Black were to play d5, takes e takes d5, the structure with the pawns, let's say c6 or even uh, c5, it's a little bit un unpleasant for black potentially with these hanging pawns on c5 and d5, something like bishop g5 and knight e1, knight c2, for example. Um, and so uh, for that reason, that's why Pavel played c6 because in this position, after c6, knight c3, d5, if I take on d5, black can just take with a c pawn as opposed to having this structure. Like this is a structure black wants to avoid um, so if black takes with the c-pawn, he can just play knight c6 or knight d7, and it's symmetrical, open c-file, and black is completely fine. So in the game, I played queen b3 here to protect the pawn on c4. You can also play many things, rook c1, queen c2, play for e4. But I had this little idea that I'd looked at before the game, and I thought it might confuse Pavel. So because you're not really afraid of giving the c4 pawn because of all the play you get in the center with e4 if black does take on c4 anyway. Correct. But again, the thing is, in this day and age with computers... Um, <laughs> Everyone every wants to grab a pawn. Well, everyone can grab the pawn and prove that it's OK, first of all. And then secondly, uh, beyond that, that you won't even really get a chance that they know what they're doing. So for that reason, I, you, you try to come up with little ideas. Now, like, for example, I mean, people are going to see that I played this game today. I know it wasn't relayed, so no one actually saw it. Um, but I played this game today against uh, this 2400 Sp Spanish IM, and basically he blitzed out the first 25 moves without using any time. And one of the moves he played, in fact, was even a novelty. So like, that's kind of the point, is that you're always looking for little ideas to try and surprise your opponents. If you don't, it's... Uh, it's not, it's not a good feeling. Um, you know, if it's like Levon or it's some top guy, it's, it's annoying if it's like, okay, you move on when it's like a 2400 or someone and they do that, you're like, why are you <laughs> even playing chess sometimes? So The level of preparation uh, is so high across all levels now. Yeah, it is. So, like, so that's why in this game I play this queen b3 move. It's just a little nuanced idea, not a whole lot uh, behind it, other than simply trying to develop the rooks d1 and c1 and play for knight e1 and e4. So knight d7, rook c1. Uh, Pavel played h6. Uh, I don't know if this was necessarily required. Maybe you could have played rook c8. Uh, it's it's all all about little nuances. I mean, if the computer says you should play h6, you play it, even though maybe I mean it's it's hard to really rationalize what the best order of, of moves moves Black are. Black does person. in general want to play c5 here, right? Exactly. So like I think I suspect after rook c8 there might be some trick with e4 and knight g5, something like this. This might be the reason that. Uh, Pavel played h6 first. I mean, I, I know all these moves are more or less interchangeable, but sometimes, uh, I mean, wh when I look at it now, it's like, h6, that seems like a slightly strange move. But of course, if I have the computer on, it's like, h6. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's a very rational move. So anyway, the game continued knight e1. And the idea is just to play for e4. Try to open up the center. Um, and in, sp in this whole structure where black gets these pawns on c6, d5, and e6, normally it's a question of, does black get c5 first, or does wh white get e4 first? So, um, for example, if black plays rook c8, white can maybe even play e4 here. And if you get this position with takes, takes, and, and the diagonal being closed, it's almost always uh, preferable for white. for white. Yeah, it's almost always better for white. Whereas if, um, let's just say, for example, as an, I mean, let's just say I play some random move like e h3. If black can get this position and play c5 here and open up the diagonal and offer the bishops uh, to be exchanged, then it's completely fine for black. So it really comes down to black playing for c5 and white playing for e4. Right. So that's why here Pavel played uh, c5, which is very natural, but it leads to a very unusual position here. Because after c5, I take, he took on d4, and now I have this very nice in-between move d6. The point being uh, that if, if black takes on c3, you can take on e7, queen e7, and I think bishop c3 is fine, um, or even, even, uh, even bishop takes b7 probably here is fine. But... The, but the ma main thing is that um, if you don't play d6, you're worse. So, for example, if you move the knight to b5, black can play knight c5. And after you move the queen anywhere, really, you lose this pawn on d5. And black's uh, much better, Doing if okay, not winning. Yes. 
So d6 was played. He took. I took. And now, he, again, this is this is modern day theory. He he uh, had knight c5 here, um, queen c4, knight takes b7. Uh, and this, knight this c5 is, stuff is a nice yeah. trick. I mean, it's the only move because dc3 just runs into. You just um, take it with the bishop. I think you just take on a8. Actually, you takes just take on d2 and takes rook d2 and d6 bishop eight, hangs. Yeah, then, then the d6 bishop hangs. So you're just up in exchange. You've got a rook for a minor piece. Yeah. So that's why knight c5, queen c4 takes, queen d4. Very flashy, but it all sort of simplifies. Like, it looks really cool. d6 looks nice, and knight c5 looks like a nice move, but then it just simplifies into a much more normal position. So queen e7, queen h4, a6, knight f3. So you said queen b3 was a subtle idea that you prepared in your preparation. Did you, did you have this position as well? In yeah, your I had it up to this position. I think I might have had it with like rook d8 instead of rook c8, but I had looked at uh, very similar positions and I felt that um, it could be a little bit tricky to play for black because it looks completely fine. You've got an open c file, a d file's open, not a whole lot's going on, but white does have one big advantage here, which uh, is that after e4, white is threatening to play e5, and it's a little bit awkward for black because playing e5 is the, is the natural reply, but after g4, it starts to get a little bit messy. Um, the point being that if you play some normal move like knight c5, g5. I can play g5 takes and then I actually don't know which one's or better. Bishop Pro g5 and knight Probably knight g5, just so I've got knight g5, uh, removing the knight and then creating this mate threat on h7. You can probably um, go knight e6, right? Knight d5? Oh, yes, 95 anyway, is, is and you've got, you, yes. Check, so you don't get knight I don't f3. have knight f3. Yeah, so that's, that's a nice little uh, tactic if, it can, if you can reach the position. Um, so, th so the thing is, it's, it's obviously even. Everything in chess is equal um, in, a, in a general general sense, but you try to find little positions where it's uh, a little bit trickier to play or it's not, it's not so obvious what the best best uh, ideas are. And in this position, it's very hard because Pavel probably saw e5, g4, and he was very afraid. So he played rook c4, which uh, is is probably okay, but you have to be extremely precise. And it doesn't, it sort of, it doesn't, there's no harmony to it. So like when you play a move like, like rook c4 here, you're just hoping it works. Because it, if it's not holding, you're going to lose like on the spot. Because if, if there's some like e5 trick, um, you're just going to lose. So like b3, rook c5, um, without rook c5, it's losing, by the way, if he plays like rook c8, just, just e5. e5. Um, but you're sort of hoping that there aren't any tricks, because like knight a4 even looks interesting, like knight a4, rook c1, uh, bishop c1 with e5 ideas. Um, I didn't play this because I think after, after knight a4, uh, I think I walk into this little doozy. Oh, that's nice. Um, kind of trapping my, my queen <laughs> on h4. Um, so that was not a very successful attack if this would have happened. Right, but see the <laughs> thing is, it's like so when he plays rook c4 though, like you're you're still hoping because you can't calculate everything to the end, and so you're just you're looking at in a, in sequences of a couple of moves, and you're hoping that you don't blunder something. But it's very hard because when you do this, you also start to second guess yourself. You start to think like, well, okay, if it's fine, it's fine, but if it's not, you just lose, and it's a very unpleasant feeling. I mean, when when everything transpires, if you're fine, it's a great feeling. It's like, okay, I saw everything and, and you're happy. But um, if it goes the other way, it's it's <laughs> it's just it's very hard and and it sort of it it plays with your mindset as well. Because in the game, black is still fine here. So in the game I played the move e5 here. Bishop takes e5, knight to e4. Uh, black can't take the knight because the queen hangs on e7. So rook c1, rook c1. And now here Pavel blundered with bishop d6. Um, it's already a tough position to play. Uh, black is still okay in the game if he finds this incredible bishop b2 move, uh, but I, w I would really not expect a human to find this because um, it's just it's not natural for a few reasons. First of all, there's something like rook c2 and having to go bishop a1. Like the bishop holds the knight on f6, but it just it feels very unnatural. And, and even beyond rook c2, there's also this other very nasty idea of bishop b4 here. You can't take um, on b4 because of knight f6 and the yeah, queen. Yeah, because falls. queen takes b4, knight f6 is check, and then you pick up the queen on b4. So uh, black has to play knight c5, and now white plays uh, rook b1 here. And it's very hard for black to play. So black can play queen b7, and black is fine. I mean, this is, this is a long this computer line. Yeah. But, but again, to, like once you get to this point queen as a b7 human... Queen b7 is a very beautiful move, and probably the only one, no? Because he's just losing a piece, otherwise the bishop doesn't have a square. Right, and that's true. And everything's pinned as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like you can't take anything because everything is pinned here. The queen is pinned uh, by And both the point with yeah. queen b7 is that the f3 knight hangs. Right, exactly. But still, even after queen b7, it goes on because I can still play knight d2 here. And your bishop and is I still trapped And I still don't have a square for my bishop. And now if you play like Na knight d3, you yes. lose the rook on f8 as well. Um, so like here, black is still okay because the computers show that black can play knight d5. Oh, God. And now you have to play rook takes b2. 
All right. If you play bishop takes c5, again, another intermediate move in between, bishop f6, <laughs> hitting the queen. You'd obviously seen all of this. No, no I mean, you in, hadn't. In, in the game I'd seen, I, I'd seen, um, I'd seen up to this rook b1 or rook c2. I'd seen up to this point. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I, I, I mean, I didn't have a choice. I had to go right. go for this already when I played e5. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you when you when you saw e5 because you're giving a pawn. Mm -hmm. What? So you're just seen till this position and you thought it was messy enough and interesting enough to just go for it with that because you really can't spend all your time calculating till the end. Well, there's also the secondary problem that if I don't play e5... You're losing um, your queen with rook h5? I think I might even just be, be worse because it's hard to find other moves. So I, how do I stop rook h5? So uh, rook h5, for example, um, I, I, mean, I guess I can play something like g4. It does not look correct at all because something like rook c8. Um, and if I play like g5, probably knight h7, for example. Um, or even even just takes because I can't take with the bishop now because I lose the knight on c3. So like it, g4 is a very sort of it's it's an ugly move. Maybe it has to be played. And if you're playing a move like g4, it makes a lot more sense if black has committed e5, like you said earlier, so that the d5 mm -hmm. square is free for the knight. Right, exactly. That that makes a big difference too. So it's like it's one of those things where like by doing this, Pavel sort of forced me into the situation where I kind of had to go into this, and that that's also another thing that. Uh, it doesn't play as much of a role, I think, when you're playing other top players, but, but when you're playing slightly weaker players, it plays a big role in terms of trying to confuse them, because, of course, as I said before, essentially, you know, A equals B, everything everything is, uh, is equal at the end of the day. So it's like you try to confuse them, but you want to pick lines where there are many ways or many options for your opponent to sort of go wrong, oh. as opposed to having one option. Because, like, when you play something like E5, it's very forced. Black has to take on E5. Black has to take on C1. And, and now he sort of has really two moves, bishop d6 or bishop b2. Um, so kind of, uh, for both of us, we sort of for were forcing each other to go into this line. And I think, um, well, obviously I won the game, so it certainly worked out for me. But I think in retrospect, it was a lot harder for black to play, and therefore it, was, uh, it wasn't the right decision and probably should have played e5, because it's just, it was too, too hard to play, over the board at least, for, for, uh, for Pavel. Um, so takes, knight e4 takes, and now he played bishop d6, not bishop b2. Bishop b2 is a scary move to make with black. I mean, you know your piece doesn't have any more squares after rook b1 or mm -hmm. rook c2, and it does get very tricky to, to play a move like that. Right, and that's kind of the point, is like, again, I, you know everything should be fine, but yeah. there's always a limit when you start playing these moves like rook c4, rook c5, you sort of start to second guess yourself, you start to have doubts, and that also doesn't help, because then it's like, once you reach this position, I assume Pavel probably had not really... Uh, probably he, I assume he had seen probably up to here and he figured there were no real threats. Maybe he thought he just had some simple way to, to bail out here. Um, and then once you reach the position, it's like, uh-oh, I've done something wrong. Why did I play rook c4? And then the whole thought process just gets screwed up. So um, so in the game, he played bishop d6. Now I took, traded, and I played this very nice move, rook c6 first. The point being that after bishop h6, um, I think black can play, uh, well, black has many moves, but I think rook b8, uh, rook c6 and just bishop c5 here followed by knight d6 or knight d8 um, and black is probably still worse but not um, not losing the way he is in the game because here this rook on c6 it looks really nice it can go to c7 but black doesn't really have any targets either here like the bishop protects the pawn very nicely on b6 um, and if I play b4 then here black can play knight d8 Right, and then take on b4. And then rook c7 bishop takes b4 right. Because the b6 pawn is hanging mm -hmm. otherwise. Right, takes, takes and just I mean, even this, maybe, so but yeah, it's... So that's the difference. If you take bishop a6, you don't have b4 for bishop c5. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So yeah, I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're saying everything. Um, so bishop c5, <laughs> exactly. I played b4 here, that's the whole point. Knight d8, and now I played the brilliant blunder of, of the day, rook c7. Um, now, it looks like a completely reasonable move. It's still quite a bit better for white, um, but the thing was... During the game, at this point, I'm like, one, once Pavel actually played, um, once we reached this position after rook c6, I was so happy because, like, okay, I'm going to win the game. I looked at my watch. It's like 3.30. Was this that moment? It's all good. You're like, going to get to see your dad now. This yeah, is I mean, the moment. It, so it was like, at rook c6, I started to have these thoughts. And then, then yeah, at this, then as soon as he played 98, it's like, okay, um, I'll just use five minutes and it should be winning. It's all, all straightforward. And, like, I knew rook c8 should be winning. Um, and rook c8 is the best move. But the reason I played rook c7 was because uh, I, I very brilliantly thought, I saw bishop d6, rook d7, and I thought, okay, he has to go bishop e5, I just take, I can take on h6, he goes rook e8, and I just play like rook d6, collect the pawns on the queen side, win the game, smooth, simple, easy, <laughs> and just like go relax, <laughs> go go uh, ha have, have a good evening, and, 
And then, um, and then as soon as I played rook d7, Pavel played bishop b8, and I, I sort of said some choice words to myself under my breath or muttered them, um, because I realized as soon as he played this that it's not so easy. Um, so the reason rook c8 was winning was because basically in this position, when you reach this position after rook f8, a4, black's pieces are all tied up. Like he can't move the knight to b7, because there's rook c7, and I'm going to win a piece. Uh, I mean, I guess he could play bishop d6, but even bishop d6, rook a8, just collecting pawns again is, is quite simple. Uh, and so therefore, black's just completely tied up. He can't really untangle his knight and his bishop and his rook here. And so eventually, I'm just going to go rook b8 or rook a8 and win these king queenside pawns and pretty much win the game very quickly. But um, as I realized in the game after rook c7, bishop d6, rook d7, bishop b8, the problem here is that even though black's pieces are very passive, they aren't going to be passive for long because he has knight c6 followed by knight e5. And if the knights come off, it's going to be very hard uh, to win this end game. So, and, and also at the, mo at the moment, black is also up a pawn, which is important to, to note as well. After bishop d6, couldn't you have anyways gone rook a7? Um, rook a7 here, I think there's knight c6. But that's rook a6 and bishop b4. I mean, how is that different, different from the line with well, rook a8? Um, okay, so the line with rook a8 is that I'm still going to pick up the... Uh, a well, I picked up the pawn. I picked up the pawn. My pawn's on a4, and I picked up the h6 pawn. That's the difference. Okay. That's uh, that's actually the difference. The difference is, is that I won the pawn on h6, um, because in the, this line that we were just talking about, um, where is it? Uh, uh, with rook c7, bishop d6. Oh yeah, yeah, rook c7, bishop d6. Right. And like in this position, you have to remember, I'm not. I'm actually down a pawn here. <laughs> like I can take h6 now to get but the then pawn, rook but then rook b8 and bishop c5 and black's completely black's fine. Black's more than fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, maybe black even can play bishop a5 and knight b4. I mean, but um, so that that's why that's why I realized like as soon as as soon as bishop b8 occurred on the board, it's like uh oh, yeah. this is going to be this is not going to be easy at all. And um, I used like 40 minutes here, pretty much like I was up on the clock, so I could do that. But like probably for about like the first 20, I was just like really just yelling at myself in my <laughs> head for for what I had done because it was just like good thing you play fast that you've got 20 minutes to yell at yourself. Right, sometimes <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, so in the game I played bishop h6, rook e8, I came back to with bishop e3, and now the point is knight c6, because like, again, the material's even and white is better, but it, if black can ever exchange knights or somehow exchange these pawns on the queen side, it's just going to simplify really uh, into something that should be drawn. So I played a3, he played b5, and this is the other issue, is that here I can't easily attack these pawns. Like if I play knight d2, black can play knight to e5, um, and rook b7, I think something like f5 even here, or knight c4 maybe. Actually, knight c4 probably is quite good. Um, the point being, if I take, then this pawn becomes very fast. Yeah. And if I don't take, black can go bishop e5. And like, if you look at this position, it's changed very quickly. So before, black's pieces were all passive and tied up. And now, in fact, black has act an active knight, an active bishop. He can go like rook d8, rook d3, or rook black d1. Black is probably not worse now. Yeah, black might even be better yeah. actually at this point. Um, so that's why, like, I realized as soon as this happens, like, I actually be very careful, not just like, not just to prove that I'm still better, but just not to even just draw the game on the spot. So a3, b5. I played rook b7. Played rook uh, c8. Now I played rook b6, and Pavel played bishop a7. And this is another critical point in the game because one thing I think that stronger players do very well is we're, we're good at conceptualizing. So in this position, you have two choices. You can either take the pawn on a6 like I did in the game, or you can take the knight. Right. And um, it's very hard sometimes to make decisions because in the game, I realize that I, if I take rook bishop c3. a7, rook c3, king g2, takes, I can play bishop b6. And it's very hard because on one hand, you're, you're never really sure. You feel like technically this should be winning because, for example, rook b3, you can always put the bishop on a5, so black can never break and create a pass pawn either the on the a file or, really or, or the b, b file. But at the same time, you're not really sure, like, is it really winning? Like, something like h4, e5, is this yeah. actually winning? Because, I mean, you th like, during the game, you sort of think about what are the ideas. So, like, here, one idea is try to get the knight to c5, win a6, go to, like, c7, and win b5. That's one idea. Um, the other idea, I guess, is to try and go g4, h5, knight, h4, knight, f5. Right. But it's, ne it's never really clear because when you play something like h5, king, h7, g4, um, something like king, h6 here, for example, or even uh, rook, c4, king, g3, king, h6, followed by like f5 and king, h5, you're never really sure what's going on. And, and black is up a pawn here, too. So uh, that, that matters because in, in any of these end games, uh, if you get like a two on one, black can maybe sack somewhere on b4 way down the line. Um, but it's very hard because like when you see this position, at least when I saw it during the game, I thought to myself that 
this probably should be winning technically, but I couldn't quite see it. And for that reason, after like about 10 minutes of thinking, I chose not to go for this because I wasn't 100% sure. And I felt that after rook a6, it might not be technically winning, but there are better chances of winning if you're not 100% sure. So that's why I took on e6. He took on e3. I took, and now he played knight e7. And just to go back to that variation, Hikaru, which you were mm -hmm. explaining with the rook c6, bishop a7 line, you can't really put your bishop on c5 because you want to avoid the a5 break. So it's kind of important mm -hmm. to put your bishop on a5, but it's not the ideal square. But right. So, yeah, that is important. Because, for example, if I go bishop c5, then black can play a5 and create and a pass b pawn later on. Yeah, and the bishop on a5 is just not active enough to help the other pieces right. to come I into play very easily. Yeah, I mean, it feels like somehow there should be some way to win. I mean, actually, this kind of reminds me a little bit of... Um, there was this, uh, Magnus against Chakrar this year in, in Vike. Um, kind of the th same thing I think is where like Magnus had a bishop and a pawn and he had a knight and he was able to go around with a knight behind the pawns and collect them all and win the game uh, very smoothly even though it should not have been that smooth. Um, but he was able to do that. And so like you sort of feel like in, in, this, in any of these end games you should be able to do that. But if you don't see it for sure then... Um, to keep then more chances you want to try for rook a6 then. Right, because if you're not 100% sure, it's very hard. Like, you can technically think it's it should be winning, but um, if you're not certain, then you kind of have to just, uh, you kind of just have to make the most practical decision, I guess. Um, so that's why I took, traded, 97. And now this looks like it should also be quite straightforward after knight d4, but after knight d5, king f2, rook c1, um, it's, it's not as easy as it looks because I've got this weak E pawn and I've got a weak H pawn. So if I were to play like even something like knight B5, for example, uh, I think black can play rook C2, king F3, and I'm not sure if black should play rook H2 or F5. Let's just say F5 first. Um, and it's not so simple here because if you play like H3, I think there might be some, is it E5 here or knight? No, I think it's knight F6 here. First, and there there's some tricks. It's not, and yeah, it's not not so two. simple. Um, and also, the other thing is in this position after I take, this, I have these two connected pawns, but it's going to be very hard to advance them. I can't really advance the a pawn because I lose b4, and the knight knight is uh, preventing me from pushing the b pawn off the board really quickly. And furthermore, even like if you think about it conceptually, let's just say I waste a couple of moves just randomly. Uh, if you get to a position like this, even it's still going to be hard to go go a5 because on a5 there's always e5, and then you'll win, you'll lose the b5, b5 pawn. Right. Um, and you also can't go b6 because it's covered twice by both the knight and the rook. So um, it's, hard it's, to improve. it's very tricky. Yeah. So that's why um, uh, I played rook c6 here. He played rook h1, and now I played e4. Um, I played e4. I think the reason I did not play h4 again was something similar. I think there's again more of this rook and h2, then f5, knight f5, f5, knight f6 stuff, um, and like e5, knight g4, knight e4. And it, it's very hard because there is some danger here that you could end up in a position where you have these two pawns, but you lose these two pawns, and it could become some sort of a race um, eventually. So uh, that's, that's why I played e4. And I played e4 because I thought also here in this position, I'm up a pawn at the moment. But I thought this knight on d5 is really good, and if I can play e4, I kick the knight to a bad square. Like the knight, the knight ideally would like to stay close to my king, so it can. There are some fork threats or some some ideas. Um, but but by playing e4, the knight has to go back to e7, which so is a bad. Square. And it's worth noting king g1 rook d2. runs into rook d2, and um, I think this is yeah takes rook d4, and this is also just a draw because uh, there's just rook d3 to win the a3 pawn, in in a, in a couple of moves. D6, just king G7, or what? Um, if D6, I actually remember this. If D6, I think king F8, I think, then to go king E8. Because check, then you go king G7. And if rook D8, I think just like F5, king F6, king E5. Yeah. And I suspect black should be fine. Maybe maybe it's not so simple, because you can maybe go like D7 and A4, maybe. But I think it should be, should be OK for black. D7 and A4, and then black just takes on A4, what's your... Oh, you're right, the A pawn's quicker than the B pawn, sorry, yeah, <laughs> you're right about that. That would be a very nice way to make, make a loss, actually. Um, just to point it, point it out, uh, if I go like D7, King F6, I just forgot that this uh, A pawn is actually a lot quicker than the B pawn going down the board. So um, so I, I saw this, but this doesn't I mean, work. but everything I did, like playing e4 was with the idea of going king f3 because I figured the knight has to go back to a bad square. It's not centralized and I can win the pawn and the knight also right. will be much further away. Like e7, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard to stop these pawns from going up the board. So king f3, knight e7, I played rook c3, rook to a2, and now I played knight takes b5. 
And now Pavel played f5 correctly, trying again to get the knight back to the centralized square, because the knight on e7, it needs some room to breathe. And um, you, can't, you can't do any, both the c squares, c file squares are covered by my rook. Um, and knight g6 is possible, but it's still, the knight's going to be far away, like knight d6, knight e5, king e3, and b5, b6, b7 yeah. is just coming immediately. And even after the knight comes to e5, it really doesn't have anywhere else to go. So he's got to right. do something in the center, try to create some counterplay. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're just going to... Yeah, and like that's the other thing. Like pawns. here with the knight on e5, you c you can't really stop the pawns. I mean, like that, that's kind of the point. Like something like this, I'm still just going yeah, a5, knight a5, a6, b7, rook c7, a7, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's just just winning. So um, yeah, so that's why Pavel played f5, and now I played a very bad move. I again, one thing, another thing that sometimes I think top players do is you try to sort of play, uh, not play precise, play perfect moves, but you sort of try to. Um, you try to play moves that conceptually make sense more so than like a brute, for me brute, brute force method, um, which is why here uh, I played knight c7 because I thought, again, I was playing on the same theme. So the, the theme that I had in mind uh, for the last like 10, 10 moves of the game pretty much was how to play against this knight. Basically, find a way, find a way to dominate this knight and just run the a and b pawns down the board eventually. Um, so like I played knight c7 because I thought, okay, it's a great move. It stops knight d5. Now the knight, now black can't stop the pawns from just going down the board straight away. And it, it looks very logical because it, it seems that um, if I ever get, let's just say black plays just some random moves like rook b2, a4, um, I'll just make some more random moves. Like I can just go like a5, a6, b6, yeah. a7. And it seems like black can it's never really stop fast. the pawns here. Yeah. So for that reason, um, I thought knight c7. I'm a genius. Like I'm gonna win this game. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna have these two pawns. It's gonna be very smooth and simple. Um, and so Pavel and something played Something about the c7 square in this game. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah, c7. Yeah, the c and d files. Everything kind of weird going on. So like Pavel played king f8. I played b5, all according to plan. But now I played rook b2, and I sort of started to realize that I'd done something wrong because the problem here is um, well, I played a4 in the game, but after takes, if I were to take, black can play rook b4, king, king e5, five. and rook takes a4. And the weird thing is here, the knight actually is very badly placed. Like, the knight does not help the pawn here. <laughs> like, if I go b6, there's rook, rook b4. b4. And also, even if I play like rook b3, black can maybe just play knight c8, for example, or rook, rook a, actually rook a7, so rook a7 is the way to go, because you can go rook b7 and... Um, knight a6. Ah, because knight, here you have knight c5. Knight c8, yeah. Yeah, but here you have knight c5. Ah, and this, this oh yeah. order doesn't, doesn't, B6, doesn't quite B7. work. Um, in this one order, it doesn't quite work. But uh, but but what did I see? There 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 are many lines that I saw with this where um, I was I wasn't sure uh, if if it would be winning. And as, as well, like you have to remember, this was a very long game. So like I had already missed for sure. I knew I knew rook c8. I even at the board, I knew rook c8 was. was you did winning. realize at the I board knew that you I knew that rook c8. And that's a difficult feeling to deal with when you know mm -hmm. that you missed an immediate win or something that was much stronger. It's almost better to not find out over the game but find out much later. Yeah, I mean, I think when you have a good position, generally it's still under control to the point where it doesn't matter. But I mean, it's really unpleasant when it happens in a game where you think you missed something, where you're completely fine and you're still under a little bit of pressure. Um, and there actually, there it's only happened to me like once or twice, but I remember there was a game against uh, Anand in uh, Zurich in 2013, I think it was, or 14, where basically I ha we played a queen's game of decline. There was this position where I could have sacked a queen for two rooks. And in the game, I didn't do it. And for the rest of the game, I was like, why didn't I do that? I'm sure it had to be okay. And so I was sort of doubting myself and second guessing myself for the rest of the game. And, and I did lose that game as well. So uh, when you have a good position, generally it's not a huge issue. I mean, if you have a really good position, because you can normally still uh, convert, but, but it always, it, it's always bad when you realize. It's better not to realize. <laughs> I mean, it, it's like, for example, in my game yesterday, there was, uh, I missed a tactic where I could have had a much better position. and. Um, and I didn't realize it over the board. If I had realized over the board, like a few months later, I'd been really, really angry. But yeah. I didn't realize, so like the game just continued and it was, it was fairly normal. Um, so all right, so rook b2, a4, fe4, I played king f4 because I, di I didn't want to give up this uh, pawn uh, on a4. So king e4 runs into And it's rook also b4. worth noting, practically speaking here, the only, the only way I'm going to win is with keeping both pawns on the board. Like if, if I only have one pawn on the board, there probably are some 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 tricks and actually something very similar happens in the game as well. Um, but basically, I, I figured, okay, if I give up like a pawn here, even it doesn't matter. These pawns are not going down the board quick enough. Uh, my pawns are going up the board pretty pretty fast, yeah. and my pawns should 
realistically, you should not be able to stop them, realistically. And um, I think one big, um, one big reason for that, an important thing in, in these pawn races is where the king is. Your king is very close to your opponent's pawns, but his king mm -hmm. is really far away to stop your pawns. Right, exactly. And yeah. you can kind of uh, then judge from a few moves ahead that your pawns are going to be much stronger than his pawns. Right, right. So, I mean, I, again, like, this whole game, up, up until, like, this point, it was all about concepts. It's all about, like, how do, where, where do I put the knight so that I can push the pawns up the board and dominate his knight and prevent his knight from getting the key squares. Um, so, king g7 was played, and now I played a5. Um, he played knight to d5. And actually, see, so he played king g7, and I thought, okay, Pavel, what are you doing? I just go <laughs> a5, and, and so it's like knight d5, I take, you take, and I just go b6. And I should just be winning uh, this pawn race. Because I saw d4, um, I th this is winning. I remember this is winning. Uh, let me try and remember exactly why. Because this is actually a little bit tricky. I think it goes d4. Can't you just go rook c4? Uh, rook c4, I think there's rook b5. Uh, rook d, no, you just take on d4 and, and rook b4. Oh, this, this, maybe this is simpler. I saw some line during the game where we were both basically getting queens, but I was oh. quicker. Um, so, I mean, I, but actually rook c4 probably works too. Maybe, or no, 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 e3, no, no, rook c4 doesn't work, so there's e3. This I saw ah, during the game. And this then I rook b4 in the end. Yeah, That's exactly, nice. rook b4, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this I remember seeing. Uh, during the game, because yeah, actually, because I thought yeah, Maybe like we can just have that. That's a beautiful position. Let's yeah, just have that up. Yeah, rook e4, e3 takes e2, rook e4, and rook b4 is a yeah. really nice move. So yeah. now, yeah, and you just lose basically. You yeah. won't. I mean, yeah, you're losing. You. I think you're gonna lose. You're the gonna pawns, lose the pawns. probably. But um, so so I, that's why I remember this. Cause I, at first, I think I thought rook c4, and then it's like rook where? Rook c2. Rook c2 in which move? Right here. Uh, but I what? think he's too fast. I think he's too fast. I think he's too fast, though. He goes e3, e2. And e2? I mean, <laughs> a7, rook b1. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah probably if he doesn't quite. have rook b1, this, is, uh, this idea would work, huh? Yeah, yeah. At the end, would. you need rook b1. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's still tricky. Like, but I remember, see, like, the point is I saw this, and I think I calculated, like, I think I calculated rook c1 was winning, maybe, or rook a3. Maybe it was... I think it was rook c1 and like e3, e3? king e4. I, I just, I remember there was some line that was winning here. But can he go um, e2 there in that position? Yeah, no, no, you're, you're right, actually. Can, can we see that? Um, which one? The last one, rook c1. Oh, you mean rook c1, e3? King one? e4. Yeah, king e4, you can go e2. And the point is king d, yeah, rook and, d. And rook no, d I thought rook d2, rook d1. Ah, no, then king e3. Oh, then you just take yeah, and yeah. then you push your pawn. So this like doesn't work. King yeah, e3 this and rook d1. Rook d1, king e2. Rook c1 and b7. a6, a7, yeah. Um, so this is this is obviously winning for white, uh, but I saw something. Um, what, what did I see here? Was it rook c c eight maybe? I think it was rook c eight. Actually, it was the line that I saw. E three right. and rook e eight. I think this was the line that I, I remember. And I, I think this is just winning because the idea is you go a six a seven and make a queen. So like if black plays rook b five, you just go a six anyway because takes you have a seven. Rook uh, a6, you make a queen. No, but then I take. Ah, and then you go rook I'm a1. I'm too fast. You go no, I, I, well, even No, then d3? And king f3. Right. I mean, they, they yeah, rook, yeah. rook a1 also rook wins. A1, rook, yeah. rook a1, rook e8. It's because the king is so close to the pawn, it's uh, it's winning. So I saw this, and, and finally, like at this point, um, like he played knight d5. It's like I spent 10 minutes, calculated this long end game. So does he good? have nothing after rook c8? Everything's good. Everything's good. Oh, well, and he took on b5. Yes, that's... that's <laughs> That's the point. So like, <laughs> I spent all this time and like for like the second or even third time in the game, I'm like, oh, okay, finally brilliant. it's over. Finally it's over. Finally I'm gonna win the game. Finally after after messing it up so many times, and then then Pavel instantly plays rook takes b5, and it's like, uh, okay. Did you have it's another like, twenty minutes on your clock? <laughs> I mean, we were headed towards the third control, so <laughs> so yeah. I mean, but but again, because it's like, and now the problem is with this one is this one this one is not even like simple. It's like either it's winning or it's just a draw. Because like in the other one, like you can always say you've got two pawns, you can always push the pawns up the board, there always are always going to be chances. But then like like when you spent all this time and of course yeah. since it was such a long game, you start to like lose your mind because then he plays rookie five, it's like oh no. And I'm very lucky that in the game I was able to still still play on for the win because um, if I were to play something normal like King And he takes, played rook b5 instantly. Yeah, yeah, he did. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that was the other thing. It's like, wait, why did I spend all this time? <laughs> um, uh, and so, so yeah, so like, and I was very lucky because after rook a5, normally you'd play king e, f if, if I play king e4, which is a normal move, after f5, king f4, king f6, I think this is actually already pretty close to a draw because uh, eventually black's going to go e5 and f4, 
and try to exchange the pawn. So yeah. if, if I play, let's just say I play a move like king f3, black, black and play e5, uh, rook c6, king g5, rook c8, and f4 maybe isn't quite correct. I think rook a3 first is correct What's here. I think f4 might run into rook g8. And or maybe knight oh no, c4. You, no, you, can go, you can go king f6, actually. Uh, yeah, but maybe knight, knight c4. Knight c4, knight c4 no. here, yeah. Because you want to play g4, so... Right, right. I mean, it's still, I'm not yeah, sure not if you can get it. But, but the point is that here, black, if black gets these pawns, like on e5 and f5, with an active king, I'm really going to have difficulties keeping the one pawn. And, and, and the key point is just to remember that basically, if you reach this end game, this is always going to be a draw. This rook and knight yeah. versus rook is... Uh, well, Magnus has won it, so I mean, obviously you can win it from time <laughs> to time, but um, I mean, with correct play, it's it's uh, a draw. So, like, so so yeah, and I saw this, and then I was very lucky because I realized I can still. What's play harder rook to defend, seven. the rook knight versus rook, or the rook bishop versus? Oh, rook, rook and bishop for sure. Rook and for bishop. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Many people have lost rook and bishop. Yeah. <laughs> not not many have lost rook and knight. I mean, Judith lost it to Gary, I think. Uh, Magnus beat Irwin, or I mean, Irwin lost, I should say. Um, and I can't really think of other top-level events where Rook and Knight has, has been winning uh, recently, but... Um, yeah, you yeah, almost have to, like, blunder yeah. a mate in two or something. Yeah, or you have, to get, you have to get it where, like, the king gets cut off and the knight knight can sort of shield the king so you can bring the king close. But, but normally Rook and Bishop yeah. is the it's, harder, it's actually much harder. harder. Yeah. But Rook and Knight, there's no set formula. So that sometimes yeah. people also have more issues with it because of that. Um, so, so here I played Rook c7. Um, uh, Pavel played king g6. Basically, the point behind rook c7 is try to prevent f5 here and um, try to, like, if I can, get a pawn to g5 and go knight e5. So in a perfect world, I would like something something like uh, something like, like this, probably, rook f8 and, and g5. Yeah. And then I can always put a knight on f6, like a king g8, knight g4, and I can go to f6, win the pawn, put the knight <laughs> back on e5, and eventually it should be winning. But it's important because here, this pawn, uh, black can never try to trade it with f6. So um, that's, that's why Pavel played king g6 here. And now I've played, again, another only move to try and win, which is knight c4. Because again, if I take, it's, a, it's the same thing with f5 and e5 coming, and then an eventual f4. Yeah, actually, in many ways, the e4 pawn is sort of shielding your own king and stopping this idea of f5 mm -hmm. and um, e5. Right, and I mean, it's... Because after f5, you can always go, I mean, after king g6. Yeah. Knight, okay. Although here black has to play rook f5, because if black doesn't play rook f5 check, if you play like rook a1, there's knight e5 check. And this is always losing. Then he's never getting f5. This is always losing because right. now black, can black has no pawns on the f file to try and trade off this g3 pawn. So um, that's why Pavel played rook f5, king e4. And now here he blundered. He played f6, which maybe it still holds, but it makes it a lot more difficult. Um, but again, when you reach these sorts of end games, pretty much the way at least top players do it is we look at the position and try to come up with a setup where we think it's holding, or most likely that there's some, some way that you can create a fortress. And like in this position really, so there are a few things. When you reach the starting position, you realize if you can get that e5, f5, it's, you're probably gonna draw. That's the first thing. But then once we reach this position, it's trying to figure out, so if you go rook f1, knight e5, king g7, after g4, is this a draw or not? Um, so black can probably check, king f4, rook f1, knight f3, and it's hard to play this because after king g6, king g3, you still don't want to go f5 because then I can play g5. If you play f6, then you weaken the e6 pawn potentially, like rook c6, or even rook e7 here, hitting the pawn on e6. And so you sort of have to wait with like king g7, and then after something like g5, king g6, king g4, it's very hard to tell if this is drawing or not drawing. Right, because... Now, I think this is a draw still But you're still threatening knight e5 check. Well, the rook's on f1 though. So, so like king g7, if I play knight e5, black can still, I think, Give start you checks, checking. Right. Like king f4, check, king here, and then I think I just go back. And now if you try knight g4, I can just go king g7. So if knight f6, I go king g6. And I think this is probably a draw with, with uh, correct play. Um, but it's very hard because when, when, you, when, we, when, when you've been playing for so long and both players are tired, you're sort of trying to figure out what makes the most sense. And it's very hard to play this because if you're wrong, you're just gonna lose. Like if you're wrong, you're just gonna lose. Like I'm gonna get like 95 and G6 and there's gonna be no hope of anything. Hmm. 
Um, which is why I think Pavel played off six. But that's a very uh, interesting point you made, Hikaru, about that when, when you're trying to defend such positions, mm -hmm. it's very important to not go into deep calculations, but sort of just conceptualize a mm -hmm. structure or a fortress that you're trying to get, and then work towards that instead of looking for moves. Right, exactly. I mean, at this point, that's, it's very important to do that because you can't calculate everything. It's just not possible. So, um, so that's why, yeah, Pavel played f6 here. And again, it's still, I think Pavel, see, what he was thinking when he played f6 was, okay, if I can get f6, e5, so for example, let's just waste a couple of moves. If he can get e5 here, I can never really, uh, this pawn e5 will never be a weakness. f6 is maybe slightly weak, but not really. And there always are going to be ideas for the same f5, f4, f4. again. Um, so that was his, his thought process, was he wasn't sure about the other one. I, well, I assume this was his thought process. I don't actually know. Um, but I assume he thought, well, the other one is very passive, and if I lose, I just lose. Here, at least, uh, there always are going to be tricks. Like, if I ever play, like, a wrong move, there's going to be some f5, e5, or king g5, king g4. Um, and so for that reason, I think that's why he played this. Uh, however, it's very tricky, because after rook c6, black has to play rook g5, only move. Because if you go king f7, there's knight d6, check, winning the rook. Uh, king f3. Now king f7. It's worth noting rook f5 here is a blunder because I can go king g2. And again, you have the same problem. You can't go king f7 because of knight d6. And now if you play e5, I think knight d6 is winning here. Knight d6, rook h5, and knight e4. Rook f5. Rook f5, and this is winning. Um, okay, what is, the <laughs> what is the technique? I know this one G is winning. Oh, no. um, uh, I remember, I think it's... Yeah, it's rook a6. It's rook a6, and you're in zigzag because you can't king move moves. the rook because you lose the pawn. You can't go to f7 because of knight d6. So king g7. And king g7, there's knight d6, followed by knight e8, and knight takes f6. Oh, nice. I mean, actually, with rook a6, it doesn't quite work. <laughs> I realize because, like, rook g5, knight e8, king f7 takes rook g6. But so I you just need rook b6. Rook, <laughs> yeah, I just put the rook on b6 here. Nice. So that rook in the end, b6, your knight yeah. can jump and defend it from exactly. d5 or d7. Yeah, it takes rook g6 and just knight d5 and yeah. just win win material and it's just a winning Easy. end game. Um, so king f3, king f7, knight d6, king g6, knight e4. Trying to put the knight on the best square as well. Because I'm never going to get, like I can never get e5, g4 with a lock on f5. Um, and I figure here, it's going to be hard for black to play f5 and e5 because of the pin. And the, the rook is a little bit clumsy here on g5. So rook f5, king g4. And now we wasted a couple of moves. Um, played knight d3, trying to get the knight to f4 here. He played f5. Um, I think maybe he could have played, or no, rook e3. Actually, I think there's knight f4, king h6, rook c6 again. And you lose. If you lose one of the pawns, it's always it's, so it's always just losing. Um, so so now he played f5. And it's slowly getting worse and worse. Because like at the start, if you think about it, he had the pawns in f7, e6. So like f7 was a slight weakness, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Now the pawns are getting to a, a situation where if black can get e5 and f4, it's great. If you don't get e5, you're probably going to get you're probably going to end up getting Zugzwang here, which, I mean, is what happened in the game. So king f3. Yeah, so that's the trade-off of trying to play actively with f6 and trying this uh, setup because right, now your pawns... Right, it's an active setup. Yeah, it definitely is an active setup. Um, but then your pawns are more weak than they would be. Right. At this, But again, that's sort of the trade-off. It's like, yeah. would you rather play actively and maybe Take it's technically chances. losing? Or would you rather play passively where, like, if you're completely fine, it's a draw? But if you aren't, you just lose without even, like, a with, without a fight at all. Right. Um, and so that's why, I mean, I think Pavel played this. So played a couple more random moves. Knight c5, rook e1, rook a7, king f6, rook a6, king f7. Right now, I think king e7 here, I think, was maybe okay for Pavel. I don't remember. I know, yeah, king e7 was the only move because in the game he played king f7. Looks pretty innocuous. Nothing, nothing much has changed. But now there's uh, this, this very unpleasant trick, king f2. Black can't move the rook off of e1, off the e-file, because you lose the pawn on e6. So he plays rook e5, and now I play rook a7. And you can't go back to f6. And you can't go to f6, so knight d7 with the fork. So and he needed it for king d6, was that the difference? Yeah, I think that, that was, because now after king g6, there's, uh, there's this very unpleasant move. Rook c7, and, um, and now you can't defend everything. Oh, there's no move. Yeah, like you can't, you can't move mean, the rook because you lose the pawn. What about king g5? If you play and king c5, there's rook c6. And king f6, knight d7, king yes. King f6, knight d7 again, and if f4, I just take. And there's knight d3 here winning oh, the nice. rook. Oh, nice. Yes. So that's why here Pavel played f4, and then after takes, uh, rook d5, just king e3, he resigned in view of uh, e5, king e4, and he just loses 
he loses the pawn here on e5. So um, that's why I resigned here. So I actually managed to win the game, but it felt it was very, very stressful for sure. But that means even if he would have gone king e7, it's not I think over. After king e7, it's not quite over. I think it still might be winning. Um, I can probably zig zig along with somehow like rook b6 maybe. I'm not sure, because if I go rook b6, he has to go where? I mean, because in the game he played what? King f7, king f... Okay, so this position is losing if it's white's move. Okay, so he has to go king e7, and then if I play rook b6, I think he can still... No, but actually maybe he can't wait, because if he goes king f7, I think it's the same problem. King f2, rook e5, and I play rook b7. And it's the same thing, just, I mean... Yeah, he needs his king thing. on e7. Um, so can I go rook e5 at that moment? Uh, rook e5 right here. And now if I check, maybe king d6. I have to go king d6. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, very I mean, the long game still goes game. on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suspect it's probably losing, but it's, it's still, it's very hard, too, because, like, it's, there are no set ideas. It's move by move. And, of course, if you make one wrong move, you just lose instantly, like happened in the game. So, um, yeah, so it's a very, very it's difficult. very long and a very difficult game. Yeah, I mean, I think... None of this would have happened had you just played rook c8. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, that's the, that's the, the obvious <laughs> explanation. Um, and that, that makes it very difficult, because also there are a lot of twists and turns. So it's like, you know, I thought I was better than I was playing playing with these concepts in mind, just push the A and B pawns up the board. And then right when I thought I had it with A5, he has this rook B5, and, and it just starts all over again. Um, so it was very difficult. Yeah, it was a very, very long, very tiring game. Right. Now, tell me a little bit about this opening situation that you had here, where you were trying to look for this idea. You came up with queen b3. But there's opening preparation has just generally become such a huge, uh, huge thing in chess, and a lot of people, uh, they don't really enjoy it. I mean, how do you feel about this intense opening, openings that we see where people play theory mm -hmm. for 25 moves, especially at your level? Yeah, I mean, it, it's making chess very, very hard. Um, and I think, especially in the opens, because a lot of the lower rated players, like between 24 and 2500, are so well prepared um, that it's very hard to get an advantage. And I think, I think that's why um, these days I, I actually tend to prefer rapid a little bit more, is because I feel like in the old days, classical was sort of more pure in a sense, because you came with your ideas, but you tried to like prove the ideas in the middle game much more so, so you needed the time to think. Whereas now I feel like you already get to the middle game or very deep into the middle game before you even start thinking, so it's actually like kind of the, the whole situation is reversed in a way, um, unlike in the past. But you can't really ignore it. I mean, you still have to be very well prepared in the opening, even though it doesn't feel very healthy for chess itself. Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, I, I was thinking, like, I remember back in 2008, I think it was, uh, I played the Olympiad in Dresden for the U.S., and um, I played, well, I played, a, I played Hari, actually. I played Hari Krishna, uh, strong, strong Indian grandmaster. And I mean, well, actually, I can even show on the board just, like, what I was mean, the he's result? He's not going to be happy ab about me showing oh, this, I'm no, sure. Then but if, if, but <laughs> anyway, if you won, we're not allowed to show that but, game. <laughs> but the point was that basically I did not prepare before the okay. game. That's the point. So okay. in the game, I think I played, I don't know, did I play knight of 3 or did I play G? I think I played G3. I think it was G3, uh, G6, bishop G2, bishop G7. I think I played D3. He played knight of 6 I played bishop D2. He played D5. I mean, nothing special. I played queen C1. With the idea that if he castles, maybe I'll play bishop h6, h4, knight c3, um, and h5. Some kind of like fantasy <laughs> attack a little bit. Um, in, the, in the game, uh, I think he played queen d6, and after... Is your, is your set up? See, yes, it is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And yeah, so like in the game, so I played c4, he took, I played knight a3. Um, I don't, I think he might have played like, he played something like knight c6, knight c4, queen e6, and after knight h, I think this is the game, after knight h3, I think he was just like, he was much worse. Like, in, in, in the under 10 moves, he got a very bad position, and he was much this worse. This was a classical game. Yeah, this was the Olympiad, US India. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, this was a classical game. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so it looks like one of your chess.com speed chess games. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that it does as well, yeah. Um, so, like, the point of those, I didn't prepare at all for that game, um, and I was able to just play this, this sort of, like, very basic setup and just play the game. Um, whereas now, I could not do that against anyone. It doesn't matter what the level is. Like, they, they would be prepared for stuff like G3 or B3 or all these, all these different offbeat systems. And so, <laughs> like, that's, that's one way that it's changed a lot. And you really just have to prepare for everything now because there's just there's no way around it, at least in classical chess. So now, like, when you're playing closed events and, you, you know, you have your players list with you, you kind of know who you're playing so you can prepare the ideas against them. But, but a tournament like this, like the Gibraltar Masters, where you don't essentially have a player's list, uh, what's preparation like for such an event then? Um, it's it's different. I mean, I think I think you need a little bit of luck with the pairings early on. You kind of want 
the, the players who are more aggressive as opposed to the players who are more solid. Um, I've been a little bit unlucky in that sense, I feel, at least this year. Um, but like, you basically, you try to try to come up with things that they're not going to be familiar with. So everyone, no matter what the level is, they have certain uh, openings, a certain opening repertoire that they follow pretty much uh, exclusively. Um, at the top level, it's different. Everyone can play many different things. But um, most of these like 23, 2400s, they play set systems. So kind of you want to try to get them outside their comfort zone where they can't just play a lot of moves quickly, because then they're going to have to use time, and then they're more likely to get low on time and make mistakes in general. Um, so the main thing is you just try to come up with things that will surprise them. It doesn't have to be like super hardcore theory. Um, sometimes you can't avoid it, um, but generally it's just like you try to find little ideas. So it's like, it's like it was like in this game, this queen, the queen b3 idea. I mean, it's just a kind of a normal move, but like rook d1 and knight one it's not something that you'll see all the time. It's, a, it's rather unusual. So you just try to come up with things that are objectively not, not bad. Um, they don't have to be great, but as long as they're not bad and you can sort of try to play the game, that's, that's the most critical thing. Right, now, and because this is a masterclass, I have to ask you this question. What would be a one big tip for players across levels to improve their game? Um, I actually would say um, probably looking, looking at middle games uh, played by top players. So let's say you play, Knight is probably a bad example because it's too forcing, but like if you look at the Slavs or the Queen's Gambit declines, if you look at what the top players are playing in the middle game, try to understand what the ideas are, I think that's the easiest way to improve. And I think also, like I've been doing a lot of streaming, I think uh, a lot of people have learned quite a bit because like the explanations I give generally, it's, I do, ta I mean obviously there's plenty of tactics involved, but at the same time I also explain like what I'm trying to do in the position with my minor pieces. And of course when, you're, when you just look at games on a computer screen, screen or with books, uh, you don't necessarily, well, you, you, don't, you, you don't have the thoughts of what the players were thinking at the time. But still, I think if you look through what they're actually doing in the middle game, that makes a big difference. And that's probably the biggest way to improve, um, I would say. That's, that is something that everyone doesn't seem to do. Because um. everyone looks at tactics, and every, I mean, everyone plays a million Blitz games uh, <laughs> everywhere. Um, You're talking about yourself right now? <laughs> no, but I just mean every, everyone does it. Because I mean, it's the most natural way to, to improve because uh, you, you get better pattern recognition. It's the most, tactics are the simplest thing to do. But I think if you're trying to improve um, in a more general sense, just looking at games and the opening systems you play is much more important than trying to memorize variations. And do you have a strong book recommendation? Uh, not right off, no. But I mean, it just, let, let's say you look at like um, Tata Steel, for example. I think there have been a lot of games being played in the uh, Italian. If you look at those games, you just go to say move 10, which whichever system they're playing, a6 or d5 or a5, whichever system Kramnik's losing with every day. Um, <laughs> when, 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 when you look at that, um, you, you, just, you just go through those games, kind of just go to like move 10 or wh whichever setup you like, go to like move 10, move 11, and then just go through the next 10 moves. Try to see what they're doing exactly. Normally it it's, tends to be pretty traditional. You would like put the knight on g3, play for d4 as white, or as black, you play for like d5, rook e8, all this sort of stuff, or bishop e6. Um, but basically try to understand what they're doing in the middle game. That's, that's the most critical thing, I think, to improving. Right, now you mentioned uh, streaming, and you've been streaming a lot, um, um, a lot. 35 sure, hours man. a day almost, it seems. <laughs> Not that much, <laughs> Not but that you know, much, how are you balancing your professional um, playing life with the streaming because you're also yeah, streaming I mean, like a professional? Yeah, I mean, the thing is actually before I played in uh, London, I did a lot of streaming and I didn't actually play well. I didn't film London. I, I know I survived the classical You're talking about the London Chess Classic? Yeah, yeah. The I mean, one I, that you just I, won? I know that I won <laughs> it, but I mean, in the classical games, like I did not get good positions against Maxime. I did not get a good position against Fabiano. So um, obviously in Rapid and Blitz, I played better than them. But nonetheless, um, I felt I didn't play great. And that's sort of when I started. So uh, I've sort of just like basically been nonstop chess. Like I stream, then I study. I've uh, been doing it all. Obviously, the tournament hasn't gotten off to a good start, but um, but I think there's there's a lot of time in the day. And uh, if I wasn't like streaming, I'm not sure that I would necessarily be studying chess either. So <laughs> it's it's not Trading. necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> that or like wasting time playing games. Plenty of plenty of other things. Right now, um, before I open up to our audience, uh, today we had a big announcement by Emil Sotovsky about. Fide and Aegon's contract regarding the World Championship being terminated. Uh, Aegon's only going to be involved with the, with the World Championship cycle, only with the Grand Prix. And Fide has full control now over the rest of it. Your thoughts on it? Um, I only saw like a Facebook post maybe five minutes before I came down <laughs> here, so I haven't really seen the details. Um, I think it's a good thing from what I understood. The contract, as far as I, as far as I knew, is almost unbreakable. So the fact that they were able to to break the contract and, or cancel it um, is definitely a good sign. Uh, 
I think things are different. The, the Grand Prix Grand Prix cycle is going to be a bunch of uh, knockout events. There's going to be another knockout for, for a spot in the candidates. So I think in general, I don't know if I agree with them changing all these things, but I think certainly trying to do things differently um, is, is a very good start. E even if it doesn't work, it's good to be doing something different. And that, I think we'll see where it goes, but it's, it's always a good sign considering the way things have been for the last like 10 years. Right. Well, we're going to open the floor for audience questions. Anybody? And if you've got something online as well? <laughs> Not too sure. <laughs> do, you have any, do you have any other hobbies apart from chess? Uh, streaming, apart hobbies. from chess and <laughs> streaming. <laughs> uh, hobbies. Um, I like to read, actually. I read, read a lot, uh, quite frequently. I think reading is probably the favorite thing that I like to do with my free time. Um, that and also like playing sports. I, I really love tennis. I like swimming as what well. What kind of reading? Oh, um, well, I was re I mean, I'm still reading this book, but I'm reading this very heavy book uh, on the healthcare system in the U.S. right now. Um, <laughs> I think it's called a, bit, a Bitter Pill is the title. Uh, it's about 500 pages, about like two-thirds of the way through the book. So um, I read a bit of everything, a lot, lot of history um, as well, uh, some sci-fi too, so a bit of everything. All right. In the, in the opening that you showed in the game against mm -hmm. Yano, uh, what about the of the queen b3? What about the bishop a6 in different situations? How do you uh, right? So that? oh, you're saying if black plays, plays bishop a6, a6 right on away? queen b3? Yeah, or yes. Or even the later moment when you play rook c1. Yeah, I think on bishop a the reason that bishop and, and even later. Yeah, I think the reason black didn't play bishop a6 right away is because I think here after knight e5 you've lost at temple, so you've got bishop b7, bishop a6 like. To give you an example, there are many lines where um, normally, uh, not from this uh, system actually, but something like uh, something like g3, bishop a6, you, like there, there are positions like, like this that, that can occur. But in these sorts of setups, black's gone bishop a6 in one move um, instead of two moves. Whereas uh, in the game, it, you, you uh, are using an extra, extra tempo to go bishop a6. And after bishop a6, knight e5, um, if you castle, uh, I think rook fd1 is still a slight issue because it's very hard to develop. You can't go knight d7 because then you lose the pawn. And if you play knight d7, I think c takes d5, knight takes e5. There might be d6 here, but even even just d takes e5 is probably quite good because I think I think after takes I think white can play knight takes d5 here. I'm not sure if I remember the line perfectly, but I think I think there's some tricks here with bishop d5, knight d7, and. Uh, uh, I think it's e6 here, and I vaguely remember this being dangerous, but it, it's, I mean, I know there's theory, I don't remember it right now, but um, normally it's, it's because you've played bishop b7, so committing an extra tempo uh, is going to hurt with the development. Right. Anything else? We've got... So you're sponsored by Red Bull. Do you, do you actually drink the Red Bull can that's sat there? <laughs> Does he drink it often? Or do you drink the whole can or two cans or three cans during <laughs> a game? And do you find it helps? Uh, I mean, I, I've actually, I haven't been drinking Red Bull during this tournament yet. Um, uh, sometimes I do. Uh, it's, it's a mix. Sometimes I drink Red Bull. Sometimes I just drink water in the can. I mean, uh, <laughs> you, you, can, you can do either. Um, but for the most part, I've never found that it, it makes a huge difference unless I'm really tired. So, um, like, if I'm really tired, I think caffeine in general does help. But if, I, if, if I'm just, like, on the times and everything's good, it generally doesn't make a huge difference. So I, I don't feel there are uh, many advantages. That game that you just showed us probably required a can or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That game, <laughs> yeah, that game did, yeah. No. 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 They've also got Abdul Malik Zansaya now. Yeah. Oh, very nice. From Kazakhstan, very yeah. Interesting to have uh -huh. new sponsors. I wanted to ask a question uh, about the game because uh, you mentioned that uh, you had to uh, prepare the line until the position when you were going to play e4, and you had uh, thought uh, variations where he would play rook d8 instead of rook c8. Uh -huh. When you reached that position, you had played almost uh, very rapidly. Yeah. The, how does this affect his decision of playing such a risky move, such as rook c4, when he knows that you have been playing very quick and you might know this mm -hmm. uh, move and be able to refute it by home preparation? 
Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's very hard when that happens. It's happened to me many times as well. Um, I think generally, everyone comes to a certain point where they're prepared. And so I think Pavel probably, he wasn't playing instantly. He was using a minute here or there. I think he used like a couple minutes to play CE4, a couple minutes on Knight C5. Uh, so he kind of was sort of in his preparation. But I think uh, when, you, when you reach those moments, uh, it's very critical sort of to just remember, as, as I always say, it's hard to do this, but they're like, you're always doing okay. Like, you know there's always a solution to the problem presented in front of you. Um, and so, like, that's, for me, it's like, I try to just remember that, and if I don't see anything wrong with whatever I'm calculating, I try to move relatively quickly. Now, of course, if that keeps happening beyond that move, like, let's just say I blitz out E5 or something, then, yeah, psychologically, you, you really don't know. You think, okay, either you're completely fine or you're just losing, because obviously it means you're playing what are the top computer suggestions. Um, because any time your opponent moves instantly, it means, for the most part, uh, that you're, you're playing the best moves. Um, so I think, in general, like, you, I just, for me, I try to stay calm, try to remember everything is always okay. Like, no matter what, there always is a solution somewhere. Um, and that's generally my approach. So chess is very rich in resources. Any position yeah, I you think, can. I think computers pretty much have taught us that short, if you, you can do anything, I think you can probably make one or two slightly dubious moves even in the opening. As long as you don't make an outright blunder or something that's like just, you know, push the F pawn in front of your king or something, something insane. Well, not <laughs> move one maybe, not, but, but if you do it like, you know, you do something that fundamentally violates the basic opening principles, then yeah, I mean, you can end up in trouble. But when you prepare stuff and you're in, at move 10, move 15, whatever it is, like, you know you're always going to be okay. So um, it's just very important to remember that. And that's, that, then you need to use, use like 15, 20 minutes. I, I do that quite frequently. Um, at the same time, it can also backfire for the other opponent because if you're using no time um, and you just blitz out to like move 20, move 25, then you're not really in the game at the same time. So like in, in Vikonze, there was a game uh, between, I think it was Vita and, and Van Forest, and Van Forest played, I think, 30 moves or something using maybe one minute for the first 30 moves, and he lost the game because the thing is, he, he was so programmed just playing these moves instantly that he wasn't really in the game. He wasn't calculating, he was just making all these moves. Uh, whereas his opponent Vita had had been thinking a lot, and so therefore he was calculating. He was he was sort of right there in the moment. Um, so it can cut both ways as well. So we've got a message from our chat. One of your fans, um, Zila Begus, Mr. Nakamura. Thanks for taking my question. <laughs> Why do you think the bomb cloud has not gained too much popularity in classical that's, that's, chess? That's, 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 that's a that's a great troll question. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not a good opening. Let's, let's leave it at that. It's as simple as that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we've got one more. Abba or Red Hot Chili Peppers? Um, right now, I would I would say Red Hot Chili Peppers. Right but now. Yeah. You said that, uh, so we had this quick fire round yesterday. It was like a rapid fire question thing we did with you where you were asked what was the song that you would sing in your mm -hmm. American, uh, American Idol uh, audition. And you actually said Dancing Queen by the ABBA. Yeah, I know. Cause it's, it's, <laughs> more, it's more upbeat. It's an up-tempo song. That's, it's easier to do that if you don't have any rhythm than to like do something that's more <laughs> rockish. All right. All right. Any more questions? I have a quick question. I, I haven't asked you enough in my career. <laughs> okay. uh, there's an old saying that history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. I'm curious, have you ever won two chess games using the exact same trick? Uh, talking about against masters, we're not talking about like your mm -hmm. scholastic days or anything like that. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm sure it happened when I was probably around master, I am. Um, but in recent years where I used some idea and it worked twice, um, I mean, I, I would say like the King's Indian, but that's not really a, an idea specifically. Um, but that's the only thing. I would say the King's Indian, the, this uh, 92 line, I beat several people in it. I beat Belyovsky, <coughs> Beli I think. I beat Gelfond. I think there was someone else that I beat. And it basically you reach the same position by like move 14 or 15. And that's, that's about as close as I, I would say that I've come to winning multiple games at a high level with the same idea. So you reach the same favorable position using different move orders, but you're still getting to the same comfortable position as well. Yeah. Well, I think it was literally the same position almost move 15. So, and comfortable is... Uh, a nice way of putting it, because you can also just lose, so, <laughs> yeah. Any last questions? Don't be scared. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're done with the audience question. Before we let you go now, you've always been um, somebody with a style of play that has really suited open events, and you've mm -hmm. always uh, performed uh, extremely <coughs> well at them. Uh, last two rounds, the first two games here, have mm -hmm. not really gone your way. Um, how do you recover from that? What is it that you do to get back? Um, I think just, just pl doing more of the same, just playing good moves. I think, I, like I said before, I think uh, there's a fair amount of 
luck involved in the sense that depending who you play, like sometimes your opponents, uh, like my game today specifically, where your opponent just somehow comes prepared with the opening idea. I mean, he played a novelty, and there was no reason he should have ever expected me to uh, to play the line even. So sometimes that happens. Um, but for the most part, I think if you play good moves, generally, you know, the cream will rise to the top. So, uh, and, and I mean, I like I, th I think back to the Blitz and Rapid, especially like in, in those events, there were plenty of people who were who were down, and then towards the end, somehow they start creeping back towards the top. And I think. I expect here it won't be much different. Uh, if I if I play well, I'll have chances because it's such a strong event. And um, I mean, Levon and Ma Maxime already drew, I think. Um, so there there are going to be a lot of draws. So I just need to put together a streak. And also, when I did win this event, and I believe it was 2007, maybe eight, wh whichever year it was, uh, I did win my last five games. So um, after starting three and five, I won five in a row. So uh, certainly anything can happen. Right, well, we're looking forward to your combative chess. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you for doing this with us, Hikaru. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.